So welcome to the second half of this day. Um, we have um, this big theme which is uh, capitalism and uh, capitalism in crisis. And we have for this we have two very interesting presentations. Uh, first is um, uh, Fabio Vigi. Uh, he is originally from it Italy but he is based in um, England for 20 years now and he is uh, teaching in Cardiff and is professor there. So um, yeah, I just will um, give him the microphone and he will introduce himself. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, thank you Eva and thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I don't speak German first thing. I'm really sorry, but it's definitely on my to-do list. So hopefully in the next uh, couple of years, I will manage to come back and, and, and do a paper in German. Uh, for the time being, I'll stick to English. Um, I hope everything is going to be clear. If there's any big problem with what I'm saying, uh, please just let me know and I can just slow down or whatever. Because um, I do have a tendency to speak too fast. But hopefully my Italian accent will help. <laughs> a little bit, right? It does help. Uh, so, the, the th obviously, I've been, I've, been, I've been thinking about this question for ages. Um, the question, not just the crisis of capitalism, but of uh, crisis capitalism, which is a slightly different concept. I will try to explain it today. Um, as I said, I've been, I've been trying to understand it for a long time. And obviously, with the pandemic, um, the acceleration of crisis has also caused an acceleration in my mind insofar as I was trying to understand uh, where we were going. So um, my writings and my uh, work on, on crisis capitalism has accelerated with the acceleration of crisis itself. Um, today I'm going to speak about a few themes that I think are important to understand where we are today. Um, and uh, I've got a long presentation but I've only got half an hour so I will get to it straight away, um, and I will, tr I will start with, the, with an overview, which I think is important, because this really is what my thinking about crisis capitalism is. First of all, what kind of crisis? Obviously, crisis theory is a big topic, right? The theory of crisis within the Marxist tradition, but generally within the left. So my theory is that we are living through a crisis of value creation, creation of economic value, that has been accelerating since the third industrial revolution um, in the 70s. Uh, the idea is very simple. The use of new technology, particularly microelectronics, digitalization, etc., means that more labor power is eliminated than reabsorbed by the system. That is, of course, a problem both for workers and for capital, even though capital doesn't understand that it is a problem for <laughs> capital itself, right? Doesn't get it. Why is it a problem for, for capital? Because the total mass of surplus value, and I insist on total, is reduced. There is less and less surp new surplus value that is created, right? This is now being something that is accelerated since, I think, the 1970s, uh, obviously much more in recent times. Uh, we will go back to this idea later on, hopefully. Then we have neoliberalism, which is exactly what has happened after the crisis of, of the Fordist mode of accumulation. Uh, and with neoliberalism came the compens compensatory type of capitalism that we still have today, which is based fundamentally on financialization. So we have a, financialization, a, 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 finan a financialized economy where the speculative sector, right, the speculative sector becomes the engine of capitalism. It's no longer, the basis is no longer the labor-based economy, it's no longer labor power, but the basis of capitalism is what once was the appendix of capitalism. In other words, it is the financial sector. Within that idea, 
I think it's even more important to underline that credit or debt depends which way you look at it, right? We can think of it in credit, but it's debt also. Is, in a sense, the new gold. It's really what sustains the whole economy, right? We are more and more addicted to credit creation programs. And I think this has happened as a consequence of the implosion of the previous mode of production, the labor-based mode of production. So that's the second point, right? The third point that I want to underline, and that's what I've been working on since the pandemic, is that now we live in a kind of meta-emergency type of capitalism. With the debt-based, ultra-financialized bubble capitalism that we have today, we also need more and more emergencies, or rather capital needs more and more emergencies. Um, or if you like, states of exception, right, if you think of Carl Schmitt. Uh, and this is something that hasn't just started with the pandemic. I think it started earlier, we probably all agree on that, 9-11, there's been a series of, you know, states of emergency situations where practically we've entered a, what in Britain they call perma-crisis permanent state of crisis, which is not just about the economy, it's about society. It's about the wider society. With the pandemic, obviously, we have a massive acceleration of that idea, insofar as society itself closes down, has been forced to close down, right? But I think this is what I call meta-emergency or perma-crisis. So we've got these three points that I want to try and connect and see where we can go from there. Now. One, one notion we, under, we often hear about today is new normal, right? The idea of a new normal, I think we were talking about it just now. I think to understand new normal, we need, I think, first of all, to understand that we are going through a paradigm shift, a, a massive change, a, a very deep, profound change in the way we live. In a sense, we are moving from uh, the idea of a capitalist crisis to the idea of crisis capitalism. Right? And there's a, a difference between the two. With the idea of capitalist crisis, we normally understand a crisis followed by a boom, right? as part and parcel of what capitalism is. Capitalism move, pre moves precisely, traditionally at least, from, bu from boom to bust and then boom again. Right? Cycles, what they call business cycles. Business cycle ends in a crisis, a new business cycle begins. So that's often what people understand uh, you know, as a crisis. A crisis is followed by a period of growth. I think that idea is ended. We are now in a different kind of crisis. Crisis now means that capitalism uses crisis, uses manipulated crisis even, manipulated emergencies in order to sustain itself or at least to prolong its existence into the future as much as it can, right? With whatever that means for us, for the society. So I think this is, there's a difference, I think, in the way we understand crisis. It's not necessarily the old crisis of capitalism that led to a a boom or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, a new business cycle, but it is a specific use of crisis that capitalism, capitalism makes. The moment I say that to my students, they all say that I'm a conspiracy theorist, of course, straight away, straight away, straight away. If you say that somebody is using, not only my students, even my left friends, leftist friends, or philosophers, whatever, the moment you, you argue that maybe the system is using crisis, to do something else, they immediately accuse me, of course, of being paranoid and it's of being... Sense Sorry? It's common sense here. Common sense here, right? I think everywhere, I, you know, but I think this is important to understand that even if we don't, we don't think of three or four people around a, like a desk like now deciding what to do, there is still agency, of course. There is still some kind of human steering of the machine, right? Somebody is steering the machine. The machine has an engine. It goes by itself. It's called mode of production. 
and it's very much an automatic pilot. Capitalism goes in automatic pilot, but there's always somebody who steers the machine at the same time, who makes decisions so that the machine moves in a certain direction rather than in another. And I think we are within that moment now in history where those who are at the wheel really need to make important decisions for the mode of production, for the system itself, as it were. So now, let me just, since we're talking about paranoia and conspiracy theories, where are the critical voices, right? This is something I'm sure you've discussed before, but uh, for me, those who criticize the new normal, what we can call the new normal, just to simplify a little bit, generally, even from the left, share nostalgia for liberal capitalism and what we call the work society, right? For traditional, good old, liberal democratic capitalism, right? I, I know a lot of people who are, consider themselves to be radically leftists. However, they always bounce back to the good old liberal values that capitalism has actually helped creating. So the problem is, of course, for me, not just an ethical problem. The problem is really almost a deterministic problem because capitalism is destroying that world. Capitalism is make itself, capitalism itself is making that good old liberal democratic order obsolete. That's my point. It doesn't work anymore. It needs to turn authoritarian from the point of view of capitalism. The, the good old consumer society is out. We have, capitalism itself has to reinvent it itself, right, at this stage in history. That's my perspective. The other problem we have, of course, with that big question, critical voices, is this. The limits of capitalism are also the limits of our imagination. It's very difficult to imagine a world beyond capitalism. Maybe we should take this seriously. Maybe this is a real problem. Easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. This is something that I think uh, Frederick Jameson said uh, a long time ago. I think this is still very, very relevant and we should take it seriously. However, at the same time, if we continue to avoid thinking about the end of the system, and the system is definitely driving towards some kind of point of no return, then there is nothing but barbarism, I think, ahead, quite uh, frankly. And the kind of barbarism that is normally uh, expedited by political disavowal, political denial. It's not happening. We will go back to good old days of liberal democratic capitalism, right? This is normally the way in which we end up in barbarism, you know, in some kind of horrible place. Uh, so, for me, the other, the other point that I want to briefly um, discuss now is the idea of controlled demolition. The system is demolishing itself, little by little, no doubt, but I think one of the ways in which it tries to avoid the hard landing, what they call the hard landing, is to, to establish this sort of controlled demolition. Um, so, first of all, we begin from the idea that, that I mentioned earlier, the labor-based economy is being replaced for a while by the debt-based or credit-based financially driven economy. That's the basis now. In Marxist terms, MCM1, MM1. Labor power can be easily bypassed now. The center of production, the center of growth production is now the speculative sector, right? Uh, even in, t in quantitative terms, there's a, there's a big uh, difference now in terms of the, the, the value created in the speculative sector with respect to the value created in the labor-based, in the real economy, the retail economy or real economy. The pandemic was, for me, that's the way I called it in, 19, in, uh, 19, in 2020, 2021, a financial event. Manipulation of markets means manipulation of reality. Now, if you want to manipulate the markets, and they did with the pandemic, because with the pandemic they, they created Nobody even knows exactly, but 9, 10, 11 trillions dollars and 
pump them into Wall Street, essentially, because they needed to do it, otherwise the whole house of cards was coming down. But they had to close society in order to do it, right? To avoid consequences with all that monetary injection. That, that was always my reading of it. What the final conclusion is, manipulation of markets now means manipu direct manipulation of reality too. The context is the work society is in free fall. We know that. Less and less value is created there and we get less and less value too. But the other side of the coin is that the financial sector is being always, constantly, every day, even now, artificially propped up, kept up, kept going. So the more the, the, more the real world deflates, the more the financial bubble inflates, right? This is the kind of balance that we're dealing with today, right? That's, that's the way in which the economy works today. Uh, central bank, mo let's take central bank monetary policy, for example. It used to be about stabilization of prices, controlling inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Now it is stabilization of decline. That's what I call it. It's a stabilization of decline. They try to make decline stable. I, I, I borrowed this term from Walter Benjamin, incidentally. He, he wrote about inflation, Walter Benjamin, in the, in the 1920s, and he used precisely this term, the stabilization of decline. I think now it's really the case. They want to turn decline into normality, right? Avoiding maybe the hard landing if they can, but nevertheless making the soft landing normal. So that's what I call controlled demolition. Why? Because that's the only way from their perspective, the perspective of the drivers of the machine, that they can continue to pump money into the financial sector. And maybe we can discuss that in detail a bit later. Controlled demolition also means at this stage, however, we, are, we have gone to the point where controlled demolition is not only the controlled demolition of the real economy, but it's beginning to look like it's also the, the controlled demolition of the financial infrastructure. I'm thinking particularly of a recent US regional bank collapse, right? And that's a very interesting story as well. The latest emergency is perhaps this. And it hasn't finished yet, right? We're still in it. The, reg the US regional banking collapse. This has started, as you know, with Silicon Valley Bank, the in Mar 10th of March 2023, just a few months ago, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. And the logic of the pandemic, in a way, returned. Collapse of that bank, and then obviously two or three other banks of the same kind, regional American banks. What we saw is the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve is the US Central Bank, pumping money, injecting money, into the system to help the banks struggling um, and pushing, of course, stocks higher. So the price of stocks went up thanks to this intervention of the Federal Reserve. That was, um, they, that's, that's the story they told us, to help the struggling banks, right? Uh, at the same time, we had another interesting phenomenon which is called consolidation, consolidation at the top. The money went out of the regional banks and into the top mega banks, like uh, JP Morgan Chase, for example. J JP Morgan Chase, which is one of the big American banks, acquired, uh, for example, First Republic Bank. Penny on the dollar, extremely cheap, including all its assets, right? This is now a phenomenon that I think will repeat itself more and more. Collapse of the middlemen, of the, of the people, the banks in the middle, Consolidation at the top, right? This is part of what I'm calling controlled demolition. Not only in the real world, but only in the financial world this is happening now. So, what are we looking at here? We're looking, yes, another opportunistic event. It's kind of obvious that regional banks would collapse. Why? If you raise interest rates, right, as, as the Fed has done now for months, those middle banks were exposed to treasuries, so to bonds. The moment the price of bonds, the interest rate, sorry, 
goes up, the price of bonds goes down. That's how it works, right? So, and the Federal Reserve, of course, knew it. So there is an intentionality there, intentionality to kill the middlemen, the central, the, you know, the regional bank, the small and medium banks, let's say, so that the deposits, bank runs, the deposit go to the, to the top. Yes, there is opportunism. At the same time, it is also true that we are living through a debt crisis, a bond crisis, right? Bonds, insofar as bonds are debt securities, and insofar as bond, the bond market is really the center of the financial market. In a sense, the stock market is a derivative of the bond market, right? The system needs the bond market to remain inflated so that the money can continue to flow, can continue to be borrowed and go into stocks. So it's a very interesting mixture of opportunism, but also a symptom of a real systemic breakdown that I think will begin precisely with the bond market. So a, debt, a crisis of debt, what we call a crisis of debt. In Europe, we know a lot about that, right? That in Italy, we know a lot about that. The Italian debt is always in crisis, right? We're always struggling to repay the debt to the, to the, to the central bank. That's why I say that our government is not in Rome, but it's in Frankfurt. Because the ECB, the European Central Bank, is really dictating politics in Italy. If they stop buying our bonds, if, they, if, the, if the European Central Bank stops buying our debt, we are fucked. Sorry, sorry about it. But it, we are we close. We default. As a country, we're going to default. So everything hinges on the bond market. This is really crucial. So quickly, um, just to sum up what I, what I was saying here, first of all, the system needs scapegoats. Now it's the way it operates. It's, it desperately needs alibis, scapegoats, emergencies, crisis, virus, war. We haven't talked about war, but I will, I will, hopefully I, I can talk about it briefly. Climate change, um, small, medium uh, banks, whatever. Some kind of crisis that can help the system kicking the can a little further. So prolonging the agony, right? Prolonging this, this, this disequilibrium that now the system is about. Financial sector being inflated, real economy being, con being uh, slowly destroyed, essentially. But the question is, how long is the road? How long can they go on with this kind of logic, right? Because it's inherently self-destructive. So how long can it last? The problem, of course, is now this. If it is sadly, but you know, that's the way it is. If the speculative system, which, you know, house of cards, you can call it house of cards, you can call it a house of cards built on a pool of gasoline. It takes very little for it to explode. Um, if, you know, it's, it's a house of cards built on dumb, what, I, what the Americans call dumb money or silly money. It's money that is, has no value substance. It's mouse clicked, literally mouse clicked, you know, electronic money created at the computer with the, you know, the, with the, with the Federal Reserve computer. You, you put a few zeros together, you add a figure in front of it, here you go, one trillion, here you go, one billion. This money has no value substance, I repeat. It doesn't come from the real economy, it doesn't come from labor, it doesn't come from investment in labor, it simply comes from a computer, right? So the system now is addicted to this kind of money. It needs to find reasons to create more and more credit of this kind. Um, the system is, in other words, in perpetual deficit, and it requires increasing amounts of mouse-clicked cash. Another, another uh, 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 way, way of putting it, metaphor, could be the whole of financialized capitalism is like a black hole Sucking cash. The more cash you throw at it, the more it needs it. Right? That's how it operates. Because of precisely this endless system of speculations, derivatives, it's an, it's an endless mountain of toxic, fundamentally, empty bets. Right? Like, that's why they call it casino capitalism. But casino capitalism is what's running the show now. Right? That's the problem that we have. Um, 
So now we have this increasingly fragile banking sector, sector that I think is being dismantled piece by piece. In preparation for what? Now, there's a lot of speculation about what's coming next in terms of monetary system. This money system is no longer working. Money is becoming less and less valuable. It's losing value. We are going through an inflation which is embedded in our society. It's not just something that will go away. It will stay with us for a very long time. In one way or another, it can be also a deflationary devaluation, but at the moment it's an inflationary valuation, um, um, inflation. So I think a lot of people know that at the top, and that's why I think they're preparing the next monetary system. And the next monetary system is very likely to be based on what they call central bank digital currency, S. BDC. I don't know whether you've talked about it already today or not, but this is coming. Um, this is coming it's simply because they say it. it. They don't make a mystery of it. It's very much something that they openly discuss. Now, I call it safe and effective digital shots. To me, there's a nice parallel to be made with vaccines there, right? They will at so the basic point is that at some point, they will force us to take the digital money. In, in a way, they will force us to take fully digitized, centralized um, cash, just like they forced us to take the vaccine. Um, but anyway, let's, let's, let's go a little bit into that. As we said before, now we have a debt or a bond crisis that is turning into a banking crisis, and it's more and more a symptom of the implosive nature of the, the system. The system at some point soon, I think, will need a centralized mechanism of digital currency jurisdiction. Whether it will make it or not to impose it on us, it's a different story, but they know that it will need one very soon. It's also not a mystery. Since the pandemic started, they've announced central bank digital currencies as the future of monetary transaction. They never made a mystery of it. There's some nice videos. Uh, the, there's a guy particularly called Agustin Carstens, which is the head of the Bank of International Settlements based in Basel, who is explaining what he wants to do with central bank digital currencies. It's very scary, but also it's out there in the open uh, for everyone to see. Now, at the beginning, we are now, I think, at the beginning of this shift in the monetary system, which is a shift to a top-down monetary control and it's what precisely the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, calls Project Icebreaker. You can look it up. If you look it up, BIS, Project Icebreaker, you will find a nice document that will explain what they want to do with central bank digital currency. Now, I've, I've, I've uh, looked at what some of the leftists are saying about this uh, new central bank digital currency system, and I focused on Yanis Varoufakis. So you probably know Yanis, Yanis, I'm sure you know who, who he is. And I kind of like him, but about central bank digital currencies, he says something that I find absolutely crazy. First of all, he said, yes, the police already have, the state already have control over our transactions. Yes, it's true, 70% of transactions are already digital. True, we all know that. Um, Varoufakis makes the example of the Can Canadian truck drivers in February 2022, right? Their accounts were frozen. They didn't need central bank digital currencies. The police, the state, Trudeau, had the power to stop those accounts, right? So Varoufakis says, well, they can do it already. Who's afraid of central bank digital currencies? However, they need a state of exception. They needed a state of exception. They needed corona, um, and you know, state of exception is is, is time is, is a time constrained event, uh, and it's likely to um, to be met by popular resistance, as it did in Canada, for example, but also in Europe, um, in many ways. It's a totally different thing to authorize a digital system of abs of absolute uh, monetary control, right? It's a totally different thing to go from what they did in Canada to have people accept CBDCs as the next monetary system. Now, Varoufakis believes that there's a lot of good coming from this. 
He really thinks that digital technology, bank digital technology is democratic. And for, he gives an example. He says, well, we can have a monetary digital jury governed by the citizens. And I find that extremely wonderful as an idea, right? <laughs> wonderful. And he says even like randomly chosen citizens. Anybody can do it. We just uh, do a lottery thing and we just get people to do it. But how stupid or disingenuous that is, right? How can you think that, that we are going to implement exactly this, this monetary digital jury? If there is to be something like a monetary digital jury controlling central bank digital currency, it will definitely be run by the, you know, the, the ultra-rich oligarchy, particularly because that's their way of controlling crisis, right? That's their way of prolonging a system which is in crisis and a system where the symptom of crisis, the main symptom of crisis is now money. The devaluation of money. That's the main symptom of crisis today that we have. So they have to try and control that. Control that. And of course what they have in mind is precisely to control it through central bank digital Currency. So it's not just a matter of political imagination. Varoufakis has this political idea. It's, it'd be, it would be wonderful in, an idea, in a different world, maybe. Maybe it would be wonderful. I'm not even sure, but maybe it would be wonderful. But the problem is that, you know, Varoufakis and so many others simply ignore the existential problem that we have here for the system. It's a systemic structural problem that won't just go away if we introduce digital currencies and we put some nice people to control that digital currency. The problem we have now is the inability to generate sufficient amount of new value, which is social wealth in capitalist terms, through a labor-intensive accumulation cycle. The last labor-intensive accumulation cycle was the Fordist one, the post-war period, right? which ended in the 1970s precisely with inflation. Now, because we cannot have that labor-intensive accumulation cycle any longer, the system relies so heavily on credit created out of nowhere, credit like literally mouse-clicked money, and of course financial bubbles which have become now the dominant part of capitalism. Yes, greed and corruption are part of the problem, but there is a deeper structural issue here which has to do with the way in which capital works. And we've passed a stage where I think capitalism can only work through by authoritarian means. Forget work and consumption, the consumerist society. This will all also be there, of course. You know, but the dominant political, ideological strategy will be something to do with authoritarianism, some kind of control, some kind of turning of the screw on society would be necessary to control crisis, right? That's what, I, well, that's what I mean by crisis capitalism. A capitalism defined by an endless series of crises through which it controls impoverishment, through which it controls immiseration. So to me that's what the future unfortunately looks like. We can think of neo-Keynesian and of course Varoufakis is fundamentally a Keynesian uh, only your liberal recipes, even worse, but they're all yesterday's news. We passed now that point. They don't work. They tried them again and again and again in the West, you know, exchanging a bit, you know, in Europe, then in the US, etc. But they've both proven completely unable to resurrect the capitalist mode of production. And I think the reason is that those neo-Keynesian, neoliberal uh, policies are fundamentally linked to an understanding of economic science which is positivistic, which only looks at the surface of things, circulation level, never at how value is actually produced. That's the big problem with economic theory as we know it. It, it never looks at how economic wealth is actually created. It, only, it always assumes that there will always be a lot of it. 
And maybe it's just a matter of sharing it better. No, the problem is a creation problem. We are faced with a creation problem. In capitalism, the, the creator of wealth is labor, right? I think that's the fundamental point. The moment labor gets more and more eliminated from the productive cycle, of course we end up with a crisis, not only of workers, but also of wealth, of wealth creation. And there's no way with the technology we have that we can go back to a labor-intensive economy. There's no way, because individual capitals, in Marxist terms, will invest more and more in constant capital, what Marx called constant capital. So they will invest more and more in machinery, etc., because that cuts down, it allows them to be more competitive. So they will continue to eliminate labor. Not, they will, of course, continue to exploit labor, of course, inevitably. But at the same time, they will make labor less and more and more, what's the word? Um, redundant, um, more and more superfluous, superfluous. But of course, super, superfluous workers need to be regimented, need to be controlled. They need to be told what to do, right? One way or another. So the whole ideological system is changing very quickly, and we better understand it, otherwise we won't find a solution. Um, so that's exactly what I was saying. Because we, have a, we are in a kind of terminal crisis of value creation, and a, a, a rapidly deflating economy, then I think the central bank digital currencies will be used you know, as a kind of tool for um, regimentation of some kind of mass impoverishment and mass decline. Now, do I stop here? or Because I, I, I can go on for two hours, but that's the problem. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to. I don't know. Do you want to hear more? Or we, we, we can. Hmm? We have another. Yeah. Like, I want to talk about war, etc. Maybe, Maybe we we'll talk about it later. It just yeah, I just wanted to say quickly, sorry, I had so many things to say. Look at this. It's crazy. Interesting would be to talk about ways out of this crisis. Good. Yeah. I know everybody wants to talk about ways. Because I guess, I guess that there's a lot to discuss, and it's, it's probably a good, uh, a good point to stop. To stop right. And to, and to get into discussion more. Good. I agree. Yeah, but maybe you can just zoom it up just, just to, to make it a round thing, no? Just I just wanted to say one thing about, about the, what I call geopolitical perversions that we're looking at very, very quickly. Mm. And to me, it's very simple. You don't, you don't need to bother about that. We know that basically in the situation we have now, the dollar is, of course, the, the world currency, the world reserve currency. So if we're seeing a lot of what I call geopolitical perversion, if we're seeing a war in Ukraine, that has been prolonged, you know, cynically prolonged, and more and more weapons are thrown at it, more and more money is being thrown at it. Ultimately, it's because we have a hegemonic system, which is the Western model, run by the United States, that is based on the dollar, right? So, the more money you throw at the military-industrial complex, the more you also keep up the dollar as world currency. Um, keep in mind, we've been in a war for a very long time, Remember how they called, after 9-11, war on terror. It was already a war, war on terror. We need to, more money into the military-industrial complex, more weapons, more technology, right? 2001, 2002. Then that fizzled out after 20 years. The moment Afghanistan ended, COVID arrived. And then they called it the war on COVID. Exactly the same mechanism. Not weapons this time, but fundamentally, a war, in capitalist terms, always allows you to throw money at the system. A war is always a credit-making mechanism, a debt-making mechanism, always. Since World War I, we know that very well. Then, COVID ended, the day after Ukraine started. War on Putin, war on Russia, war on China. It, it, will, it will be a constant war never-ending, precisely because it's a way of pumping the dollar as hegemonic currency and the Western model behind it. A Western model based on debt, credit, whatever you want, financialization, this endless credit-making machine, right? And words are precisely uh, useful to that effect. 
so there's a lot more to say about that, but I'll stop here because I know that there's another speaker. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, we will have now a discussion and uh, we will open this session now. So please talk to, talk to Vigi if you want to know something. Okay, first the discussion and then the other thing. It's okay. Uh, my question was, uh, you have to uh, write it, okay. okay. Uh, I already asked the question, so, uh, what do you uh, propose as solutions to this problem? Yeah. I'm a, I, it, first of all, the idea of having solutions, I would love to have. I would love to have a, a, a shopping list with everything that we need to buy to get an, 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 another system. My okay, proposals, first of all, being critically aware of what is actually going on. To me, that's fundamental, the first step. Understanding that it's not just a matter of distribution, it's a matter of, money, of wealth creation. That the system is imploding, not because simply there are some bad guys doing bad things, and if we get rid of the bad guys, we'll be fine. No, if we get rid of the bad guys, some other bad guys will come up, doing exactly the same thing, because the system is a kind of inertia, is moving in a kind of inertia towards a very dangerous place. Understanding that is crucial. Second thing, um, what to do? I mean, I'm, I come from Marxian Hegelian tradition in philosophy, and therefore something has to happen before reason, you know, Hegel used to say the owl of Minerva always leaves at dusk. So philosophy always gets there a little bit too late. It can understand things, but it will never tell you what you can do. Marx said something similar, very Hegelian. I cannot write the recipes for the restaurants of the future. Wonderful metaphor. I cannot write the recipes for the, for the, uh, for, for the restaurants of the future. I don't know. I know that we need to shift. There's a lot needs to shift. A lot needs to move. Shift to, first of all, out, uh, away from the present mode of production, away from the present mode of production, which is still based, of course, on profit making. To which mode of production? To a mode of production which is where production is socialized. Right. Call it socialism, call it whatever you want, but certainly there will have to be some kind of socialization of production. Right? away from the capitalist mode of production. I think the capitalist mode of production is destroying itself, but it's very resourceful. It will find ways of reproducing itself in, worst, in, 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 in nastier terms for societies. It will convince us that we have to sacrifice ourselves for this, for that, and the other. In, at the same time, it will destroy us more and more. Okay, so being aware of this is crucial. Yes, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. We need to go towards a, um, a, a system where, where the modes of production are not simply destroyed, but they're socialized for, for, for the benefit of everyone. Or, you know. But how do we get there? The problem is how do we make that step? You know, I go back to that initial point. The limit of capitalism is also the limit of our imagination, political imagination too. We can have imagination, yes, but how do we get there? How do we convince, do we need to go through an even bigger crisis before understanding that this system is already a zombie? Do we need another pandemic to understand that the system will kill us? Or what? Because after the pandemic, I don't think people understood exactly what went on. Right? Let's face it, it got even worse. So how do we get to that socialization of the means of production? I would love to know myself. It's a big step to be made convincing the people that that's a step to make. And also convincing ourselves, because we are much more part of this system than we think we are also, right? In many ways, most of us anyway. 
So it's a big, big step. We must, we kind of know that there is, has to be a change of direction, but how to, how to, st uh, how to make it happen is a totally different story. Does that answer your, your question? I'm sorry. Um, I have got a question. If you talk about the um, end of, of uh, crisis capitalism, in my understanding, a form of uh, continuously primitive accumulation was always part of capitalism. And my question is, is this crisis capitalism really dying? Is it a problem for capitalism to uh, use this crisis or does uh, capitalism just uh, get along very well with this crisis? Because well, he, can, he can always yeah. make this, um, like David Harvey talks about the new land grabbing. There are many ways of getting value out of, of the commons, of, of the livings, of the li livelihoods of the, of the people. Um, Capitalism is not just um, Mehrwert uh, surplus um, value accumulation. There are different kinds of accumulations. And my question is, is isn't this the evaluation that we, uh, the de evaluation of what inflation makes, a mode of um, a new accumulation regime uh, where um, the capital can get uh, very cheap um, um, labor. labor and also land and mach machines, everything he needs. Okay, he can, we, I, yeah. I agree with you that capitalism can go back to a, some people call it a neo-feudal capitalism and I kind of would agree with that, that that's the direction of travel. It kind of moves towards a neo-feudal, not a neo-feudal post-capitalist, I think it's going to be capitalist. Yeah. So some people say, no, no, it's already post-capitalist, neo-feudalism. We, we are caught to, you know, dystopia, machines, technology, et cetera, et cetera. I still believe, like you, that it's still going to be capitalism. So there's still going to be extraction of surplus value from labor. That labor is going to be destroyed more and more and, you know, maybe even going back to older forms of labor extraction. But at the same time, this... You know, there's a whole class of people that need, will need to be convinced that this is fine. And after liberalism, after the last 30, 40 years, you need to convince the middle classes, first of all, you know, that, that they're, they're going to get back to the working class level or worse. And, that, and that's not going to be that easy, right? Because we're moving from a liberal to an illiberal system more and more. And that needs the, dis the destruction of of the middle classes, essentially. They will soon realize that, my God, they are also going down with the rest of us. And that's not going to be easy, I think, for capitalism to control, necessarily. They will need to come up also with some interesting narratives, ideological narratives. Obviously, they've got the climate nicely placed, right, as a, as a good middle class, as a good narrative for the middle classes, particularly that will we'll try to convince the middle classes to sacrifice for the, for the new neo-feudal neo, you know, neo, uh, capitalism to come. I agree with you, it can continue. There, there will be more and more. But the problem is that even this real value that is created in the real economy through um, labor exploitation is itself already subsidized, let's say, by credit. Right? It's already, it's, it, it already needs more and more inflationary credit to work. So, even when it grows, it's still going down in respect of the amount of credit that is needed. The amount of money that the system needs to create to make it work. So that is why the devaluation of money would be a problem for capitalism because money will continue to devalue more and more and more. And it's not just because of Ukraine, it's not just because of pandemics, not just because of bottlenecks, supply issues, not just because of it. It's because there's been a massive creation of, of, of fake money for a long time. 
and now it's rolling down the hill. The avalanche is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And soon we will feel the pain even more than we, we do now. So that's another big problem for capitalism to control. And that's why I think monetary slavery could be a way. CBDC, central bank digital currency, as a form of monetary slavery, could be a way but to control inflation. But they will need to convince us. They will need to convince us that that's the way to go. They convinced us to take the jab with COVID. Not me. They convinced a lot of people. Now, the next one, it's to take the digital shots, as they call it, to take the central bank digital currency. It's up to us. We can say no, right? The freedom we have is the freedom to say no. I think ultimately human freedom is the freedom to say no. No, I won't do this. I'd rather, or to put it in Bartleby's, Melvis Bartleby's immortal phrase, I would prefer not to, if you want to be a bit more gentle. <laughs> um, okay, I'll stop here. <laughs> Yeah, my, Sorry. my question is, goes more or less in the same direction because I had the feeling you already gave the answer when we just look at your words the other way around. Um, when we start, uh, when we look at the problem as value is created or money is created without much work, just typing numbers and without real labor, and what is if the individual by itself starts... Um, very heavy work intensive labor without real payment isn't this the answer by creating something that is for the people but nobody is paying for it when we um, say goodbye to the idea we need a big price a big um, money mm -hmm. check at the end of the month just starting to work because i see that in nature that can be done a lot like here in central europe building like permaculture, forest, food forests or something like this, which nobody values, but it has a big value mm -hmm. and it becomes this value when people start a lot of like intensive work. You mean then for a post-capitalist system or for, for a capitalist system? I, um, I, are you thinking of a post? Post or for, I mean, when you start no. planting and planting trees and starting to work and occupy places or just not occupying in Eastern Europe, there's plenty of space. Mm. That's, that's you know, one way in which it could go, a parallel system that grows and then develops and becomes bigger and bigger and then suddenly develops into something else. Surely that's one way of thinking of a potential alternative. Like I am not, though, however, against technology. I think, I think we need technology to produce and to work for us, to do the work that we don't do anymore. We just need a better organization, a different organization of society around production, you know, that is, that we can do today with technology we have. The problem is that the productivity, the, the, you know, the massive potential of productivity that we have is still linked to the capitalist model. And that is not working anymore, right? So that to me is the big problem, not technology, you know, labor. I would like to work less, to be honest. We all would like to work less, right? My God. No? No, because we have to make money to live, right? But, in, but I, if I didn't have to make money to live, I would like to work less. And have more time for something else. Right? Well, of course. But, but I'm talking about now a potential... So, I would like technology to be organized, produ to organize production for me. But, but detached from the, mo from the capitalist mode of production. Sorry. Uh, no, Sorry. Wanted yeah. Wanted, uh, yeah. I just wanted to refer to this question. It's the problem we had uh, with the periphery always of the capitalist world system. Uh, the periphery of what, what you called the permanent uh, primitive accumulation, what Joseph Luxembourg discussed already and what we did on behalf of women's labor. The same happens with the labor in the third world or in the south, always because it's not just wage labor. It's organized in different forms without wages and so on, as marginal labor, as unpaid labor, etc. Uh, but it, it, it comes to, it, it forms part of the profit, in, of the overall profit. So the way how this is organized, this, we studied this for, for 
decades. And it, what you mean is the new situation in which people who, d who cannot live in, within the system anymore, what you're explaining, are just turning out to, to form a new periphery, like, like these people who are becoming peasants again, uh, or what you are doing, for example. And, how, and the problem is how this, for example, subsistence production is again, in a new form, um, built up and then reintegrated into the capitalist profit accumulation system. This is the problem of, of your people, you know, because you're not outside of the system, you're within it, but just as the periphery or a new periphery, which can easily be, I mean, all the experiences are there, easily be reintegrated as real labor, human labor, but just not wage labor, into the whole accumulation process. This is a problem. I mean, for these people, because they just wanted to, 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 to find an exit. Um, I hope I am able to, to show a solution door out of this dump monetary system. Um, we have a monetary system, a fiat money system, yeah. um, which is uh, based on a mouse click, how you said it backed by the warships of the US hegemony. Yeah. Um, it means they uh, create money with a mouse click, they flood the markets in a Keynesian manner and uh, produce inflation and they expropriate the workforce of the working class and the, um, and the savings of the people. Now there is a solution in my opinion, it's Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a Bitcoin Bitcoin has a limitation of uh, 21 million coins. It uh, it has a limitation and it, it it is not a mouse click based money. What do you think about Bitcoin? Cause bit cause Bitcoin um, uh, is in my opinion a solution to uh, take back back the control over money from the states to the working class, because they, right. they would have the control over the money. What do you think about I, this technical mechanism or solution? Okay, I might say something that you're not going to like probably about Bitcoin. I, I don't think Bitcoin can be the solution. Um, you know, there's a reason why the gold window was closed in 1971 by Nixon, right? 15th of August 1971, they decided to, to close the 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 gold anchoring to the dollar. Um, it's because they needed to, they needed fiat money. This system needed to create money out of thin air to survive, to, what, to, to reproduce itself. So if you have a closed system, a capitalist closed system, you won't be able to do it anymore. Because, precisely because of the reasons that I, I, I try to, to discuss. Precisely because the labor uh, based society is now being made obsolete by capital itself. Machines um, are, are doing the work more than us. Wage labor based. Wage labor? Wage, sorry, sorry, not labor, wage labor based, sorry. Good, good correction. Wage labor, I'm, not, not labor itself, but specific creation of capitalism, wage labor. Wage labor is, is a creation of capital, right? Okay. But, but that this specific wage labor where we have labor time, an amount of money, it's, okay, wage labor, let's call it wage labor. Um, so yes, I think that if it helps people now, why not? But I don't think it can be the basis of, I think maybe Bitcoin is the step before central bank digital currency, I'm afraid. You know, it's, it's supposed to be opposed, but maybe they just floated it in to see how the technology works, and then at the right point, they will centralize it. That's my fear. You cannot, you cannot centralize. Not at the moment. You, can, you cannot centralize Bitcoin because bit, there is no one who controls Bitcoin. No, not at the moment. Bitcoin has not a, not, no face. Not at the moment, but it, it only takes the click of the turning the light off, you know. They, they can do it. They can definitely do it and turn it into a, in a completely centralized system. My fear is that that's the way we are moving towards. But listen, I don't want to, 
I don't want to say that it's a bad thing or a good thing. I'm just saying that I don't think a capitalist world based on Bitcoin would work, right? The reason being that, that there's, a, there's a specific reason why we went into credit creation programs. There's a specific reason why we have quantitative easing. And that's and a specific reason why we have fiat currency, because the gold-based currencies of the past simply couldn't sustain capitalism any longer. And they need to be broken. They needed to be broken. So a closed money system, I don't think, would work in capitalist terms. Maybe in post-capitalist terms, somehow, somehow. But there's a lot to be recreated, a lot to be reinvented, you know, in that level. That, that will be my answer. I, I, I also have one question on my sheet about cryptocurrency, but in a different way. Maybe now I can add uh, as a comment into this discussion that it was always uh, capitalist's nature to integrate its criticism. Mm -hmm. And so in this sense, it really can be, Bitcoin can be a step towards uh, CBDC to normalize digital currency and so on. And my question to cryptocurrency would be, but, or maybe I, I, add, I add this one thing more, that there is, I think maybe this was a little bit missing in your, uh, in your presentation, that CBDC has one substantially difference to uh, fiat currency as we know it, that it's, they call, I hope it's the right term in English, that it's scalable or programmable. So mm -hmm. they really can say with this dollar, you can, on, you can only buy this certain good and not everything what you want. And that's a big difference. And so my but is it a good difference or a, bad, or a bad difference? That they can be programmed and controlled like that? That's my question. You know, to back to you. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I would say it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing, right. <laughs> that's, what, that, that's, that's what I was saying earlier, that they want to program it so that they can control poverty. It's exactly, it's exactly how they really can establish this new feudalism. What it's yeah. like, then it's like really kind of a slavery. And uh, my question would have been to cryptocurrencies, <laughs> if it's not possible that, that also crypto, this cryptocurrency market is a kind of, let's call it escape market, um, to escape this devaluation um, yeah, by reducing the amount of, of, of money what is in, in the round. And, and the other question, which I think more important, so you don't, um, multipolarism. What do you think about this? And if, is this right. actually a way maybe to get into the socialization of the means of production as we had it before? Or do you think it's just a, uh, it's just a, yeah, a, a part of this crisis capitalism? Yeah. I, I, I answer straight the second question because I think I've already answered the yeah. first one on crypto. But I think multi, multipolarism, what we call it, I think it's, um, it's like my image is like the Titanic is sinking and we are fighting on the Titanic, you know, China, the US, Russia, they share the same basic problem. China itself is now running on credit, has been running on credit at least since 2008. Massive bubbles in China, you know, the, the housing bubbles, huge, even worse than the United States. You know, so they are already struggling with exactly the same systemic problems that we are struggling with. I don't see how that is going to get us out of trouble or get us out of, a, of, of this capitalist um, hyper-financialized system. They came a little bit later than us, but they're catching up very, very quickly. You know, they are becoming like us very, very quickly. I don't see how BRICS or BRICS Plus can provide the platform for a different post-capitalist society. I think the geopolitical struggle is a struggle on the sinking Titanic. And the iceberg is coming closer and closer. That's the way I see it. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I would love to see something new coming from that. And maybe there is a chance. I don't know. But I think it's the same logic, you know, a slightly different temporal framework. But ultimately, if you look at China, and I've been in China, I can see exactly where they're going. They need more and more. They need the state to make more and more credit. They need the, the, you know, the central bank that they have, again, to create more and more money to support the labor-intensive economy, exactly what the United States did a, f you know, a few decades back. Um, so I think they're becoming more or less the same kind of economy. Um, 
And that's terrible because you see fights, struggles, geopolitical struggles, just because both or, or all the participants are collapsing in slightly different ways. That doesn't, to me, that doesn't give me any hope. But maybe, I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. Sorry. Okay, so we go to the second. So we, we go to the next presentation from Claudia van Berghoff. And I'm very pleased that she's here. And she will uh, give us a quite different uh, view of uh, capitalism than we're used to. So I'm very curious to hear what she has to say. Thank you. Logically, it is also foreseen 
that a broad deindustrialization of production takes place so that resource consumption worldwide would drop heavily. Unlimited growth, one of the main issues of capitalism, has to be limited today because resources are limited on a limited planet, no wonder. But the consequences to be drawn could be of a totally different nature, namely, as we propose, the abolition of capitalism and the turn towards an alternative post-capitalist society. What else? The new project of the growth from above, of degrowth from above, however, is based on the assumption of a so-called climate crisis through CO2, carbon dioxide, emitted by the traditional industries for using fossil fuels. The alleged danger of CO2, nevertheless, is a myth invented and upheld by the same cloud from the UN Rio Conference, um, the UN Agenda, and finally the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, because the CO2 myth can perfectly be used as an overall pretext that legitimizes a sort of general revolution from above, leading to the planned collapse of modern civilization in all aspects and levels. It would be followed by an inverted alternative green and sustainable policy of a new global system allegedly needed in view of a new so-called climate catastrophe, which, when happening, will, however, nothing have to do at all with CO2, but with the effects of decades of a weather war caused by applied, but never, but always denied, military geoengineering. There is more analysis needed in order to reveal the real reasons for this policy, because there is nothing alternative about it at all. The process of global change from above has started to be felt direct, directly with the beginnings of the corona crisis three years ago, which attacked humanity physically on a world scale, being a sort of bio policy performed by most governments globally in tune with the World Health Organization that should be called World Death Organization today. <laughs> WDO. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, the WDO, as the mainly privately financed organization, is trying to become the basic instrument of a new world order and is trying to delete nothing less than the concept of human rights and dignity from its mission statement. In the meantime, the worldwide injections that were defined as vaccine against COVID-19 were given to 5 billion people and included the genetic transformation of the person's bodies. However, there was no informed consent at all about this treatment as it was based on a bioweapon developed by DARPA, the research laboratory of the Pentagon. Thus breaking with the rules of the Nuremberg Codex from 1947. So a growing overmortality related to the amount of vaccinations is now beginning to be observed worldwide. During the lockdowns, big capital, especially pharma, finance, and digital technologies, have doubled their profits. We have heard that already. And we have now an additional crisis with energy and inflation and the war in Ukraine. Various fossil fuel energies are to be prohibited, so-called alternative renewable energies are not sufficiently available yet and will never exist to the amount needed because the necessary raw materials will run out, like lithium, rare earth and uranium, while the new industrial revolution, the fourth one, foresees a new growth of energy supply by 70% based on the digitization of everything, in other words, 
the new energy system can indeed only function when most of us have gone. <laughs> <laughs> the new policies are for the Green New Deal and the Great Reset and are promoted from very high above our heads. <coughs> they are he heading <coughs> towards a so-called new normal, be it via the proposed end of traditional industries, of private ownership of cash, or be it via the end of a homo sapiens himself, being extinct or transformed into a trans or even post-human one merged with the allegedly intelligent or other machinery like the Internet of Things or the Internet of Bodies. So the proletariat is going to be abolished the same way it has been created by force. There are analysts who are interpreting these changes altogether as the end of capitalism, as a new feudalism, or as the road to socialism and communism. I think, however, there is happening something quite different. We are instead approaching the full realization of a civilization which I call patriarchy and its utopia, the mega machine. It is my thesis that capitalism had to be understood by being part of a larger system, our civilization. This civilization is not sufficiently characterized by just being modern, the capitalist or modern world system. So once we define the civilization in a proper way, including its history, we see its relationship with capitalism it turns out that capitalism is not independent from, but the result of this older civilization and is carrying its characteristics as well. Whereas capitalism is now by 500 years old, the civilization it belongs to is around 5,000 years old and is to be called patriarchy. Patriarchy as a civilization <coughs> has to be explained more broadly because in times of information war all concepts are broken and cannot be understood in their real meaning. Patriarchy means much more than just male domination because it has developed an utopia that is based on the overthrow of the natural order as such. Since about 3,000 years, the civilization of patriarchy tries to realize this utopia, namely the project of creating a father or man-made world. This new world is supposed to be a world of father, father and archi, meaning origin, even bomb. This project is utopian in so far as the natural world is organized the opposite way, namely as a mother and nature-made world, a world to be born. This is the order of our planet ever since. So the idea to try to turn this order upside down, not only ideologically, but also practically, needed certain reasons to develop, because all the time over, it was considered counterproductive to mess with Mother Nature instead of cooperating with her and embracing her as she was giving honey and milk, life in abundance to everybody and assured the continuation of this life through the female, women as mothers and their culture. This sort of a worldwide and sometimes golden age with matriarchal civilizations from mother, mother, and she, the womb, of the mother as the beginning, lasted long until its opposite appeared, a violent patriarchy that tried to overthrow the natural order and related culture. Because, so the story of patriarchy goes, in reality, nature herself wants men to create life 
and the world in general, and women were only the first to do so, but failed, remaining at a primitive level, not good enough for nature as a whole, and for God, defined already as the Father, allegedly having created everything. Following the true new Jew nature, therefore, meant from now on to start inventing a counter nature, a no nature, an anti nature, a nature beyond nature, a better nature, or a so called second nature, that would just be the opposite of it. In one world, a male nature. And it is only this one that would be regarded as a good perfect one, one in his name, the name of God the Father. Why did this crazy idea that seems trying to get realized only until today emerge at all, being accompanied by a war against all life, mothers, women, all of us, and the earth as such? The idea of the father instead of a mother as origin began to develop with war as the result of catastrophic migrations due to large climate catastrophes in Asia thousands of years ago. And war was first invented as a means to survive, robbing, conquering, and subduing others. It finally created the state the new form of social organization after conquest. It is only 6,000 years ago that war, as the main intention <coughs> of early patriarchy, began to destroy the world, most visible from the, Iron, um, from the Iron Age on the second millennium before Christ. War is still its main invention, and by the time Time it has developed into a world war against everything, ultimately the human being as such. This is the latest invention of patriarchy, the project of the abolition of the Homo sapiens and humanity itself, calling it even its transhuman enhancement and higher evolution so. This is why patriarchy is as a civilization and within its own logic is eventually going to put an end to civilization as a human-based one altogether. War is a technology of destruction, and it is the te te technology of patriarchy also in times of peace. It is the method to turn everything upside down. And this is exactly what patriarchy needs in order to approach its utopia, a male creative, creative creation of the world as such. What I found out was that most important for the development of patriarchal techniques has been ancient alchemy, the former mother of all sciences, yet under patriarchy the so-called hermetism of the Hellenistic period in ancient Egypt. Alchemy once was based on the techniques of gardeners, mothers, and wise women and men who engaged in the protection and promotion of all life. After the conquest, it was taken over by the conquerors, who then became the pharaohs, the fathers, in the case of Egypt. They changed these techniques into their opposite in order to produce opposite results, namely a man-made life. It has been a historical process of thousands of years of trial and error until the method of a patriarchalized alchemy of making gold and life appeared in Europe during the Renaissance and already before. This inverted alchemy started to become part of the emerging natural sciences as we stem of capitalism. So modern science has developed on the basis of patriarchal alchemy, and it has brought alchemy to its historical first apparent success by inventing the machine, the real opposite of nature, natural life, and of birth-giving mothers, 
and as such declared to be a higher and better nature and life per se. In my view, the machine can be regarded as the most typical result of the application of the patriarchally transformed alchemical method, which consists of three steps. First, the so-called mortification of living matter, that is, is death by dissolution, dissection or dismemberment. Second, is new coagulation with other matters to form the so-called opus magnum, the new creation. And third, the invention and application of the so-called philosopher's stone, an elixir or a general means supposed to guarantee the overall success and velocity of the creation process that would not need thousands of years anymore to reach another supposedly higher stage of evolution. So the philosopher's stone of capitalism rooted in patriarchy today is the machine and that of the machine is energy. The energy question thus is absolutely central at present and in the future as without it the machine is not running. Following the logic of patriarchy, the, pro the products of modern alchemy have been presented as the better, better nature and even as the invention of life itself, as modern science did something no one would have dared to do before. From the 16th century on, it denied the existence of life itself, declared nature as being dead matter, and defined what seemed to be alive as the result of mere physical chemical processes alone. This way, the steel scientists could destroy nature at will without being called murderers, as nature was supposed to be dead anyway. And on top of this assumption, scientists could claim their inventions to be different, namely alive. So when the scientists and engineers had invented the machine in order to replace life living nature and people, they proclaimed to have created life itself, like God himself, simply by defining the machine to be alive, a, ma a mere tautology. So they saw themselves as the creators of life, as from their point of view, there was no life until the machine was invented. This is the real myth of the machine. Patriarchy's utopia consists of transforming the entire world into a single machine, the mega machine, meant to replace nature as such. And it is capitalism that was and is needed to realize it. Without capitalism, patriarchy would not have been able to get always nearer to its utopia. And on the other hand, without patriarchy, capitalism would not have had the vision and the project of why and how to transform all nature into capital, being by definition the invention of a better nature and life. This is why the left believed in progress and development as well and did not engage neither in the question of ecology and the death of nature, nor in feminism, understood as a critique of patriarchy generally. Without patriarchy, capitalism would perhaps have stopped with mercantilism and would not have invented the machine as a form of capital that realizes the patriarchal utopia more than other capital forms. Finally, capitalism would perhaps not have destroyed the living world by applying alchemy as the method of creation out of destruction. Using the proletariat, by the way, to do so. All this, however, was, we do not know, as there was no capitalism without patriarchy and no modern patriarchy without capitalism. They are a sort of Siamese twins of modernity. Patriarchy is the religion, ideology, theory and deep structure of our civilization 
and capitalism or socialism have become its practice based on the technology <coughs> of a patriarchalized and modernized alchemy. For the first time in history, patriarchy with the help of capitalism is now next to its perverse realization, the utopia of the mega machine, in which the capital forms of the machine and of command merge to build a technocracy and thus a technocratic dictatorship, if not totalitarianism as such. The mega machine today will turn out to consist of a system of natural life, not so natural life, artificial life, humans, non-humans, transhumans and machines combined as living machine or machine life. All transhumanists pretend the need for humans to merge with the machine, the computer and the internet of bodies or of things for being then elevated to the new evolutionary stage of becoming the so-called homo deus, Harari, something like God's humans, who would be part and parcel of the divine God machine of nothing less than the universe itself. Wow, <laughs> says Harari. What else is being created through modification by the fathers, chimeras, cyborgs, sentient beings, a transhumanist called them, like created out of the big melting pot of atoms, molecules, and DNA of all types of creatures, plants, animals, humans, and AI, on the way to a second creation without mothers, produced by the convergence of the new technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, genetic engineering, synthetic biology, AI, nanotechnology and mind control, as a part of new electromagnetic technology to which the already mentioned geoengineering belongs to. The fourth industrial revolution thus is going to fill the world with its alchemical wonders based on the modification of all matter down to the sphere of quantum mechanics and on its way to immense new profits until all natural life is spoiled and spent by transforming it or the so-called green or grey goo is doing away with everything leaving us in face of a possible omnicide the death of everything but before there will be the chaos that the fathers of the nothingness, as I call them, will have produced. Now summing up, capitalism has served patriarchy as the civilization that needed and therefore invented it in order to produce a new world, the one of the fathers. It turned out to be the world of the machine made to replace and create life and the mega machine trying to replace man, the mother, nature and society, even civilization as such. A non-patriarchal capitalism or socialism has never existed. What is occurring today is the final adaption of capital to the new conditions created in 500 years that do not allow 8 billion people to continue living under the actual premise of the limits to growth. The proletarian masses that have been used to create capital out of nature and to transform it in the factory are not needed anymore. On the contrary, the machine in its various forms and as a general fetish is instead taking over. The proletarian and women as housewives and mothers of the proletarian adding to their unpaid labor forced upon them with a never counted amount to the accumulation of capital are not relevant anymore so that, so that they can be left as gender or trans, trans, transhuman. But capital and its form as machinery has become central, including capital as command, 
First, capital as money and general commodity, as well as free entrepreneurship, are not essential anymore. This way, capitalism is reduced and transformed, but saved, and is going to be adapted to the new phase of this development of patriarchal civilization, which in the longer historical process and its dynamics is getting always nearer to its final realization, pure patriarchy's mega machine, the alchemical war system, as I call it. Everything has been put upside down. The inversion has been completed. All creation is built on destruction. The result is the weaponization of everything, even man and life. War is now paradox is the paradoxical general condition of existing, the pure war, as Paul Murillo calls it. So said Weizenbaum, the German Austrian co-inventor of AI expert systems at MIT in 2008. Quote, if the fourth industrial revolution is being realized, the living will envy the dead. Quote end. This capitalist patriarchal dystopia and its reasons are collectively unconscious. The general belief in alchemical wonders still prevails. Now, however, the moment of truth has arrived. Progress and development Apocalypse blindness, as Günther Anders calls it, machine fetishism, digitization, nihilism, necrophilia, mass murder, omnicide. No, thank you. Let's put the, the world from its head back on its feet again. A post capitalist world is not enough, it has to be a post patriarchal one, and of course, too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, we do have another round of questions, and yeah, and then that's the end. And I just wanted to announce one more thing. Uh, please, uh, we have a donation box. So in the end, when we finished, uh, it would be great if you could uh, give some donation. Thanks. So uh, yeah, so we uh, open up this, the question sessions, and uh, yeah, we can ask Claudia. First of all, thank you for this uh, wonderful analysis, I would say, of the society as a metaphor. Uh, so, my thought would be, you know, I, I, I immediately thought also, I remember the film, Dead Man, by Jim Jarmus. Have you seen it? Anyway, I thought immediately about this film, as we talked about the machine, you know. Um, my question is, hmm, what can I pose it? Uh, so, indeed, is death inevitable? Would our position in this situation, it's a proposal, so I want to ask what uh, your position to it, would be the overcoming of the fear of the death, of our own death and of the death of our beloved people, and a way to free ourselves uh, from these central ideas through, through overcoming the fear of the death of what this system is imposing. I didn't get it. 
Wäre es eine, eine Antwort ja. zu dem Problem, die Überwindung der Angst des Todes, des Todesamtes? Ja? Weil dieses System ist. Kannst du das, das noch ein bisschen weiterbringen? Okay, dieses System ist äh, konzentriert äh, auf Tod. Und vielleicht wäre es eine Lösung, gegen dieses System zu arbeiten wenn wir diese Angst überwinden. thinking uh, the whole current system is driven by fear and I think this is maybe the, maybe the first step to, to overcome this fear and just get into, into action and into inspiration and just start thinking and talking about what, what you really want, you know. I think the solution is not just uh, knowing what's going on, the, the solution is also like to, yeah, to start really thinking and talking about what, what has to be changed, you know? Or maybe just leave the system and just start something new, you know? Sometimes the whole system, or the system, what we have now, that's my opinion, it, it can't be changed anymore, you know? So why don't we just uh, use our whole fantasy and our utopian, what, you know you call it, you know, knowledge and just uh, just start to figure it out, you know? So that's that would be my... My answer, you know, to your question. Okay. <laughs> 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 it's a mega machine. You so far is nothing you have invented. It's a mega machine. So <laughs> <laughs> about um, the situation we are living in, 
happen where media or um, authorities try to uh, explain us how the future will be or how we have to act or how we have to work. We can use your theory to understand <coughs> that um, they um, working against nature and trying to, to understand um, maybe a, a trying to find maybe a better way to, to do it different. Just to identify those priests of um, patriarchy with your method. Is it is it developed like this that you can that you can use it as a blueprint? more stupid for me than we often give them credit you know the master plan that they might have they just they're just trying out different things i don't think they have specifically a trajectory like to kill us all or whatever i know that this is one of the theories that you know people would be so superfluous i was saying that earlier right they're not going to be used as proletariat anymore they're going they're not going to they're not going to be needed so what, what to do with them? Right? You can put them in front of the soap on the television, give them some money to watch Netflix, I don't know. I could buy some drugs. Maybe that's one other solution. You don't necessarily have to kill them all, right? It could be more dangerous to kill them all in a sense because then they might react. So I think it's more complicated, right? Where you can just watch Netflix. But I think the, the struggle is also based on understanding that that they are more stupid than we often think they are. And there's a, the, the there is always an opening. There's always some, some cracks that we can also take advantage of, right? Rather than thinking that the machine, the patriarchy, whatever you want to call it, is, is going to execute this master plan, if you see what I mean. Second thing is, I think resistance is human. Like human beings are defined by their resistance, really. Why? Because most of the times we do things without knowing why we do them. We say no without understanding necessarily why we say no, but we know that we have to say no. So for me, complete totalization is impossible. You cannot totalize humanity and put it in a box. Impossible. Because we, at some point, will just say, Know, one way, different ways of doing it, but it's called being human. We are also without knowing why, without having, we don't have to understand everything to be able to say no. We have a deeper knowledge that things are wrong, and at that point, we just say no. And, and in a sense, we are ready to go all the way, right? Because we want to, we want not to, we don't want to do it. So I think it's more complicated than than that. You know, it's not just about because then the problem is, how do we do what you say at the end of your paper? How do we step out of this mega machine? Mm. But no, you found it. 
knowing about it is not enough. If, if, if knowing <laughs> was enough, then we would have some wonderful world already. If, no, it takes more than just knowledge, I think. Oh, the first step. I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. I agree with the first step. I agree. But a lot of people know and yet they don't. Right? A lot of people sense that things are wrong and yet they don't do. So I think something else needs to shift, it needs to move. And it's not necessarily a conscious thing, right? It's maybe a deeper thing that we don't necessarily understand, and yet, you see. So, because if, if it's just about knowledge, you fall back into that patriarchal narrative of rationality, right? Mm -hmm. If it's only about knowledge, knowledge is also the product of that patriarchal system that you're talking about. unconscious. Ah, no, it's unconscious. unconscious. Yeah, of course. Okay, so, so you have to be conscious. So that's what I was I was getting at. But the unconscious is unconscious of limits. You cannot translate it into something conscious. Mm -hmm. This is Freud. This is no, no, no. no. The unconscious is impossible to to know. <laughs> So the unconscious remains unconscious, you know. It, it's symptoms, modes of enjoyment, but it doesn't. That's why there are become. therapies, I think, to make uh, unconscious things unconscious. No, no, no. You don't. Have, the, the unconscious remains unconscious. You can adjust your ego around the unconscious, so you can have a different mode of tackling that problem that you have, right? If I like, I give you an example. When Freud was asked what to do with insomnia, he said, find a, a night job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't Freud, but somebody else. But still, that's the, that's the point, right? You don't, you, don't resolve, you don't resolve your unconscious problem, but you can, you can shift your position to live with it. Yeah, but that's one part. That's always so I love it. So I love it. Yeah. Can I anyway, I don't want to do psychoanalysis, right? I mean, let us go back to what we were talking about before. But still, the problem is it cannot just be knowledge in that traditional patriarchal way of knowledge. Otherwise, it's about philosophy. But it is a good belief system. It's a belief system. We have this since thousands of years. And what I said, collectively unconscious, this is what, what is behind capital. Patriarchy. This is collectively unconscious. And I'm saying it. I mean, I have made it conscious to me. I mean, there are not so many who got it, you know. <laughs> it's because patriarchy is mostly defined as male domination and nothing else. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, really. But the belief system can be changed. I mean, and Freud, this has nothing to do with Freud. The belief system can be changed. The religion has always been changed. Or often. And we have also. So this is, of course, possible to know what's going on, not just as a knowledge, but as a, as a different thing. As an experience, as a, as a, as a mode of enjoyment, as a number of things. So yeah. When you talk about beliefs, it's a different story. Yeah. So when we use your blueprint that Claudia was developing and say that the patriarchal system was. Tearing us apart as they do in the alchemy. So they tear apart the soul from the body and the mind. So um, when we try to reverse this and we try to heal ourselves and find a solution, um, then would be one part um, the mind has to understand, but then the body has to follow, and then the spirituality has to follow. So what you're saying is correct. Your blueprint fits in this. But I see, so we are understanding the problem. We have to materialize it back in our body and find back the spiritual way to, to bring this into the world. So that's how I understand your blueprint to solve this, not just the knowledge, but all those three steps that have been tearing apart by the old alchemy. And it's an inversion, it's all perverse. It's all inverted. We knew it better in former times. So we have to remember. Remember. Yeah, remember. Yeah. 
what we knew before. And we have it within us all the time. Uh, if not, I, would, I couldn't do that, what I did. <coughs> it's the, to, to reverse the inversion we have in our mind, in our soul, in our bodies, in what we are doing. Also ich hätte ja jetzt vermutet, dass mir vielleicht als aktueller äh, Kommentare oder Kommentierung äh, erklärt worden wäre, äh, wie ich mir jetzt die vielen Frauen in der Politik vor äh, erkläre. Also wir haben ja aktuell eine feministische Außenpolitik, die wird mir erzählt, kann man zweifeln, das stimmt. Aber wir haben vor allen Dingen in Nord- und Westeuropa so eine, so eine Art Partygirl, die Ministerpräsidentin sind. Und mal eben in die NATO eintreten und mal dies und mal jenes. Ich kann da den Fortschritt nicht wirklich sehen. Ich bin ja aus der DDR, wir haben zum Beispiel Gender Studies nicht gehabt. Die Besatzer haben so ziemlich als erstes Gender Studies eingeführt. Ähm, die hatten das damals noch anders, Frauenstudien und so. Äh, das Gender kam erst ein bisschen später, also als Name. Und es ist seitdem alles schlimmer geworden für den Geschlechter. Wenn es so ist, dass der Patriarchismus oder das Patriar patriarchalische System und der Kapitalismus mehr oder weniger ein und dasselbe sind, dann reicht es doch, den Kapitalismus abzuschaffen. Und dann habe ich doch, wie die Arbeiterbewegung das mal im 19., Anfang des 20. Jahrhunderts gesagt hat, die Befreiung des Menschen ist auch die Befreiung der Frau. Die Befreiung der Frau kann nicht sein ohne die Befreiung des Menschen. Vom Kapitalismus, vom Kapitalismus, kapitalistischen Dogma. Und dann brauche ich doch nicht das Wege einander hetzen der Geschlechter. Wir waren in der DDR, also wir hatten keinen Paragraph 218 mehr, wir brauchten keine Frauenhäuser, wir hatten frauen Ruheräume, wie hat die DDR in dieser Frage immer falsch erzählt, als Benachteiligung der Frauen durch Doppelarbeit im Haushalt und so weiter. Da wird dann immer vergessen zu erzählen, dass die Frauen in der DDR fünf Jahre früher in Wendy gegangen sind, dass die Frauen Haushaltstag hatten, dass die Frauen äh, nicht zur Armee mussten und so, das wird dann immer vergessen. Und waren die Männer keinen Haushaltstag? Es haben ab den 80er Jahren haben dann auch Männer Haushaltstag bekommen, aber in den 50er, 60er, 70ern, da war der Westen auch noch nicht so weit wie wir uns. Und wir hatten schon Ministerinnen, da konnten die im Westen das nicht mal buchstabieren, dass das gehen könnte. Und so weiter. Ja, ja, ich weiß. Patriarchat hohe Stellung zu erreichen, hat das mit Feminismus überhaupt nichts zu tun. I wanted to say that uh, we are not all alone. There are still other societies and cultures, and it's uh, old critics from Red Indians from North America uh, to the Marxist people that they say they have the same uh, uh, violent view on the world, on the nature. They call it Mother Earth and that they violate it in the same way as the capitalists do. And they don't really care if it's a capitalist owner or if it's a, a worker who does this so-called technological uh, progress. And I also think that we should uh, think about this myth of that we are going on a technological progress and it could go on. And the other point that we could learn also from uh, other cultures in the world. Uh, I want to add to this what she has said. Uh, what you say reminds me to what a friend of mine, who was an indigenous thinker, has said in our communication, he, he uh, 
use a very simple metaphor to compare our civilization to uh, his culture. He said our civilization can be uh, described as a tyranny. Its essence is domination. And his culture can be described as a circle, which means every element in this culture sees itself as linked to the other, and uh, there is no domination there. Domination is, is, is even uh, seen as something bad. And you say, patriarchy uh, is a belief system. Can you mention the main beliefs of it? And you also said, uh, what we have forgotten can be remembered again. Can you say what has to be remembered? Thank you. Well, the question of domination is not only domination, you know, it's change, transformation. It is different. Domination is not enough. It, it has to, it is uh, over the overthrow of the natural order as such. Something else. It's not just domination, you know. It's more. It's much more. I'm trying to uh, go to the to the ground of it. So uh, the other worldview is circular. It's not hierarchical. This is true, and it's not transforming. It's cooperating with nature. It's not transforming her into her opposite. I mean, this is something different, you know. First of all. And all traditional um, mythologies of beliefs is of, of, of I mean, experiences. The old tradition, the pre-patriarchal tradition, is an, um, um, one of the reality and not of fiction. They didn't imagine the world, but they lived it and worked with it. This is magic. Magic is to work with the world as it is in its interconnectedness. Recognizing the interconnectedness of everything means that you can go everywhere in a way. You come from one point to the next and are not stopped. So this is uh, something like working together, cooperating together. And breaking through this thinking, um, like for example in animism, when animism was destroyed, that everything is alive, or even the stones and the landscape and not only the flowers and the animals and ourselves, and we relate to each other. This is totally different uh, thinking, and this was destroyed by these developments I was explaining. We not only separated and divided, but never coming together again, and then only on the basis of division, you can destroy things. If you don't divide them, you cannot destroy them. So division and separation Thinking in separate terms and acting and dissecting things, then you can do something with them and you can transform them or kill them or recombine them, etc. But just in a totally different manner, not the way it was created and or was born and it was living. This is the violence that I am attacking. So you have to forget about uh, the necessity not only to dominate, but to transform nature. If you first of all, you have to know what is nature. I mean, because science doesn't know what nature is. In the contrary, they don't want to know it because they want to destroy it. You, you don't have to know what you destroy. You wouldn't be able to destroy it anymore. So they have, they say, life or nature or the world is dead. They say it's dead until now. If you say it's alive, they say you are, um, you are what school? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Now, of course, you remember. I mean, every mother, for example, remembers what it means to be to be embedded in nature because it occurs with her. You know, so men could learn a lot from women because they make this experience by giving birth, for example, and th because this relates them to the universe. To the, to the forces of the universe, because these are the main forces, the same forces that create life or, or galaxies elsewhere. And this relates them to everything. So women have this access by nature, they have an access to these experiences, 
And I remember them, of course, very easy. But uh, of course now, it's, uh, for example, how was that in the Costa Rican universe of San Jose de Costa Rica? You are not allowed to, to, to speak of mothers anymore. The word, the word mother is abolished. You're punished if you do this, images. I mean, this is really a very good example. What means remembering that you have a mother, that you are a mother or you know a mother. I mean, very simple to remember what it, what it means. So this is from the, just an example. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, regarding the mind control, um, how far are they with you uh, shortly talked about the mind control as a weapon they use um, to control um, our thinking? And um, I, uh, how far are they with this project and weapon um, with this 5G and everything? Because I don't think they are that stupid because when they control our minds, we can't say no anymore. And you, uh, with this 5G um, radiation, and if this works, um, I, I, I have the fear because then I can't reflect it anymore and I, can't, I don't have the knowledge anymore because then I'm kind of connected to this mega machine and then I can't um, opposite or, or I can't control my mind when everything is like lost. And I can't say no anymore because I'm not a human anymore, I'm like a machine. And I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Claudia, what, um, are there any informations? How far are they with this um, controlling us with radiation and digitalization and connection to the machine? Very difficult question because it's an invention of the military, of course. And always, alpha, etc. And they have made a lot of <coughs> experiments, in, you know, from the 60s, etc. On. But of course, they, we don't know all what they can do. Not at all. And, and all these technologies, we don't know it because they have made many experiments outside of the public, uh, also in genetic and not in, 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 in biology, synthetic biology, etc. We don't really know. But what we know is that through um, Nikola Tesla, who was uh, um, not inventing but describing electromagnetism as the main force in life and, and on Earth, and um, with these waves, electromagnetic waves, electric and magnetic, I mean, these are natural waves, you can produce them, of course, artificially, and you can, so this way, you can just cut, go into light light itself is organized uh, in electromagnetic waves, not as just the matter uh, uh, like steel or stone, but it's swinging, or light is in swing, and you can introduce something into that system. And with, with that knowledge, with Nikola Tesla, he could invent uh, so many, I mean, terrible machines even, he, he, I mean, he, he knew that it would be if used in war, it would destroy even the earth, etc. You know, and, and not only the brain, but the brain is just next. I mean, all these people who are interested in the brain, but they are not interested in in uh, in knowing what people really can do with their brain, because they want to use it for their own aim, or they want to suppress it. You know, so that you wouldn't go um, as a revolutionary. So you would feel different. You would think different. This is what they know. They want to transform it into experience, to make experiences with this transformation. You, you don't know how far they are. I mean, I tried to find out several things, and uh, but this is enough already. I mean, Elon Musk is even trying to to change the thinking of his dogs and, and, and ape, what, uh, apes. What else did he do? <coughs> implant in the brain, you know, and they even have developed a matter as something like a jelly or so and that is accepted by the brain because otherwise the brain would explode, so it wouldn't accept such, an, uh, such a thing within it. And they have invented a matter in which, which uh, the brain accepts 
you know, as always, they, they, they find uh, solutions to problems because life doesn't like to be transformed and it defends itself. So they always find tricks how to avoid the um, reaction of the body, for example, in transplantation, uh, in this organ transplantation, you know. So you have to find out how to prevent the body from, from, ex uh, from expelling this organ, the foreign organ again, and, and they found it. And so they are trying to do all that. And it's just not, well, very dangerous. And on the same way you can transform the earth, with, uh, with uh, electromagnetism, you have these uh, ionic pair capacitors like half. We are working with these methods, but on a, on a macro level, so on a on a planetary level, changing the weather and, and etc. or producing um, catastrophes, you know, of all sorts. You can do that. It is geoengineering, and uh, the mind is just another. Uh, object of this technology. And you cannot hope that they would uh, just uh, find a um, some, some maybe limits. They don't accept limits, these people. This is why I'm so brutal in my words, because I want to say what they think and what they do, and not have any some like illusion about that. We don't need illusions anymore. These people don't want uh, us to be happy, really not. And this has to be said, you know, it's a taboo. But we have to break the taboo in order to understand what, what is possible. So I cannot really uh, answer, answer your question very well. Maybe that was not, not a bad final word for the, for, for, for the very interesting evening and like, Really, th thank you for attending. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Claudia, uh, for sharing your thoughts, sharing your work. I think it was really like thriving. And I also think that like it's we are advanced in time and everything, and there is something to eat and something to drink, and we can uh, keep going the discussions in small rounds. And uh, uh, yeah.